Hi, Deb. Hey, thanks so much for hey, joining us so on our straightcast. Absolutely. My pleasure. I know you're doing some exciting work, and I'm just delighted to be a part of it in any way I can. <laughs> well, you're actually a pretty big part of it, that's for sure, because you're where it all started, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't know if folks know, but, you know, back in, what was it, 2009, I was sort of on this journey to sort of figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, and I saw you on a TV talk show while I was on the treadmill, because I needed a distraction from walking on the treadmill for sure, and you were being interviewed about your book at that time, which was 48 Days to the Work You Love. And mm. I was thrilled to pieces to hear what you were saying, and I ran out and bought your book, and then I bought the No More Mondays book, and then I listened to a couple of years' worth of your podcast in a few months, and then uh. I engaged with you in Eagles Club coaching, and frankly, Dan, my life has not been the same since. Well, I trust that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a wonderful <laughs> thing. It really, really is. So I Well, I, I never get tired of hearing those stories. <laughs> Well, you know, Dan, one of the reasons we're doing the Strength Cast series is it's really to encourage folks that perhaps, like me, had, you know, lived their lives and maybe undervaluing what their strength really is, not seeing that that strength, that thing that they do really well, quite naturally, of course, is something that they can use in many different ways, on many different platforms, in many different channels, industries, serving all different types of demographics, some of them maybe on a volunteer basis, some of them in a business themselves, some of them even in a career. And you as a coach, Daniel, you're coaching so many folks, and I know that you do a whole lot of writing, and you come across some stories and some amazing ways that folks have taken what they've been naturally gifted at, and how they've found new ways of using it. I wondered if you would share with our audience what your, ex you know, your experience has been. Sure. And you framed that really well. You know, so often, no matter what our natural talent is, we kind of assume everybody can do that. Hmm. And yet that's not true. We're so individualized, so personalized, and you certainly know that with your study about even in personality we're different. But the things that we do easily are probably things that not everybody else can do as well. So it's sometimes a very short path to just formalize those or package those in ways that really bring value to other people. But yeah, I've got lots of examples of sitting here in my office just right behind me is a, a beautiful piece of art on the wall that was done by a young man who came to me as a pastor. Now, he had had a dramatic change in his own life, and he thought the most godly thing he could do would be to be a pastor. So he went to church, I went to seminary rather, got ordained pastor of a church. What well, was a miserable time of his life because he was just eking out a living, making peanuts. He was working nights during the week at Holiday Inn as a desk clerk just to try to keep the lights on in his house wow. and came to me very disturbed. You know, how could do, doing something so right make him so frustrated and miserable? So we kind of started peeling back the onion. And I asked the questions like you just alluded to, you know, what is it that when you're doing it, you really come alive? What is it that when you're doing it, you feel like you're in the zone? We talk about athletes being in the zone. For him, this young guy who was an ordained pastor, it was painting. He had never done anything with that, but he would go into a room in his house, shut the door, put on Beethoven or Mozart, and just paint these real bold, abstract paintings just as a cleansing, cathartic experience. Well, I had him quit everything he was doing. For four years, we created a real clear transition, but for four years, he did faux finishes for people, but during that time, established himself as the artist who brings, it, it, the byline we came up with is bringing visual life to music. Wow. Everything he does in art is music related. So now we have all these hotshot musicians, and not only in country music, but rock and gospel and classical, who recognize him as the go-to guy for art with a musical theme. And that's an example of something. He was doing it just because he enjoyed it. He never dreamed that that was something he could actually put a framework around and have it be the source of his income. And the other thing is, often we look at those things that are true God-given gifts, and we undervalue them, just like you said. He never thought about using that he instead tried to do something right, but it wasn't a good fit. And yeah, I find I love, what, I love what you said because how many artists do we know who 
they're gifted in, in such an amazing way. And what they're struggling with is that, well, that's just something I enjoy, not something I do. That's right. You know, I, I find the same thing with writers. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we often have writers' conferences here. I love to work with writers. And, you know, we, we're told that 81% of American population say they have a book in them. Well, most people never do anything because they see it as impossible. You know, we know, we know all the stories. Just like artists, you know, what do we hear about them? They're starving artists. Mm -hmm. Well, again, if I were to list ways to make money easily – Writing would not be on the list of the first 10,000, I guess. Yeah. But if that's a fit, if that's something that somebody loves to do, if it's something that just naturally explodes out of a person, then that is exactly what we want to take in frame because that'll be your best source of not only doing something that's fulfilling and meaningful, but also income. And in those kind of situations, I know it surprises people a lot in how income shows up in often unexpected ways. You know, Dan, you have a conference, actually. I think it's Right to the Bank, right? W-R-I-T-E? That's right. And you just had one, I believe, a few weeks ago because I had a couple of friends who were actually there. Did you really? Yeah. And what I love about the, the, the workshop that you put on is that it's not just hype about, you know, how to write, you know, a, a great, perfect paragraph. It's really the real key to being a successful writer is actually selling your writing. <laughs> And being able to you monetize know, it, it and market it. And I love the fact that your approach is very holistic. It's not going into English 101. It's going into, here's what it takes to be an author 101. That's exactly right. And we have the most amazing people who come here, people who are very talented and people who clearly understand English composition, syntax, punctuation, grammar, and all of that. We don't spend much time on that. You're absolutely right. Because what people really have to understand is, okay, if you are gifted as a writer, how are you going to sell and market that? And it doesn't matter how, what you do in terms of the logistics, whether you self-publish or work with a publisher, it still comes back to you as the author. You better figure out how to do that well. Robert Kiyosaki, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and all the writing that he's done, he jokes about that because he says, yeah, people say I'm a best-selling author. He said, nobody ever accused me of being a best-writing author. I'm a best-selling <laughs> author. And, and I love that it, because we say the term best-selling author, but we never really say that to mean that person understands marketing, promotion, and turning that into a viable business. But that's what we teach, and it's a wonderful process. You know, Dan, like writers and artists, you know, there are so many folks who have this thing, this one thing that they just do so naturally well, like you had suggested, they just take it for granted because it's come so easily to them and for them. And oftentimes, I know even when I'm coaching folks, they struggle to val to really put the value to it. And the value is really best, I think, quantified when they use it and they're serving someone else and they're getting feedback from someone else who seems to be wowed by something that they think is just so natural that everyone does it. Dan, what would you suggest? I mean, you wrote this ebook. I think you actually have it on your community site, 48days.net. I think you give away, isn't it an ebook on 48 ways to make money? 48 low cost business ideas. That's it. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a hoot. I put that up as a result of a radio interview that I did a little while ago where the questions came up you know, can people really stay at home and create extra income? And I said, oh my gosh. There are ideas everywhere. I mean, I can't walk to, down the lane to get the mail without having three or four ideas. So I put that together very quickly, and it obviously is a hot topic because about 140,000 people have now downloaded that. Uh, we, we are because of that. Now, this is the way that I do my writing. I always test. I don't do anything in secret and then Say, okay, now if you pay me $20, I'll show you what's in between these two covers. <laughs> Anything I have in between two covers, I've already showed to everybody I know and anybody wants to see it. Mm -hmm. They tell me, does this have value? Is this something that's going to help me, give me inspiration and hope in what I'm doing? So now that that little pamphlet on 48 low-cost business ideas had been such an, a hot item, we are now turning that into an actual product on our website. And I think that's being done right now as we speak. Oh, that's great. Because what I love about that is that stimulates so many ideas in folks. 
oftentimes, you know, they just have to look out at what other folks are doing to get ideas. Like, I love the story you tell about, is it Jim Hodges, the gentleman yes. who reads history books? Would you mind sharing that yes. story? Because when you told me, when you and I were coaching and, and you shared with me, you were talking about ways to monetize things, and you, and you told me this story about a gentleman who all he loved to do was read history books. And I'm scratching my head thinking, okay, I'm not quite sure how you make money doing that. But would you mind sharing that story? Because I just think it's so relevant. It's so, it's so seemingly inconsequential, but it certainly has changed yeah. what he does for his, for his life. Oh, absolutely. And I love to tell because it's a great example of what you're talking about. So often those things that we just love doing. I mean, how often have you heard somebody say, well, sure, you know, I love, you know, growing dandelions, but, or I love playing golf, but, or I make beautiful cakes, but there's always that immediate assumption that there's no way in the world you could frame that in a way that would actually generate income. Mm -hmm. But Jim Hodges mm -hmm. is a, a great example of that. He had been trained as an educator, but then he spent most of his adult life in the military and on retiring early and knowing that he had a lot of productive years left he assumed he was going to be going back into teaching but he knew that the public classrooms had changed dramatically in all those years he'd been in the military and he'd heard stories that it wasn't always a real happy place to be and it wasn't always very financially rewarding so one of those fateful nights out with dinner with his wife you know she asked what everybody ought to be asked at some point you know Jim if money were no object what would you spend your time doing? And he very quickly said, I'd sit around the house all day and read old history books. Well, today, that's exactly what Jim does. He sits around the house and reads old history books, but in doing that, he creates audio recordings that bring those old history stories to life, and that product is then sold primarily to homeschoolers. Jim and his wife travel around the country. They love seeing different parts of the country. They attend about 10 homeschooling conferences every year, and make well over $100,000 net profit selling his product. Now, that, now he's, he's still doing what drew him to teaching, to really bring these old stories to life in a way that inspire kids and let them know the, the rich deposits of truth and principles in history. He's still doing that, but not just in the one single most common application where we would expect him to be standing in front of a classroom. No, you can take the unique skill that you have and put it in some unusual application that will give you results that go way beyond what most people are going to experience. He's a great example of that. He's a great guy. Oh, I would love to meet him someday. I just, I, I, I am so inspired by his story. And, and Dan, you know, one of the, you know, we, you and I have known each other for a few years now. And as you know, it's sort of like, I'm your biggest fan or stalker, however you'd like to say it. But I, what I really so appreciate is you have a heart for helping folks. And whether you do it through like just last night, I listened. You had a really great program that you hosted on 48days.net. Don't get cooked in the squat. Yes. What a great. You know, it comes from, an old, yeah, well, it comes from an old Ziggler yeah. story. Well, years ago, I heard Ziggler talk about it. And if you've ever heard Zig Ziggler, you probably heard the story about mm -hmm. as a little boy going next door and the neighbor lady was cooking biscuits and he noticed the biscuits she pulled out were about the size of a silver dollar. They were very flat. And he said, you know, wh what's happened to those? What kind of biscuits are those? And the lady just threw her head back and laughed. She says, you know, son, those biscuits were getting ready to rise and they just got cooked in the squat. <laughs> And a lot of people are like that. They, they kind of have some ideas, but they just get trapped in the day-to-day -day busyness that we all have, and they just never get out of the starting gate. They don't do anything. So last night, we, we had a fun talking about, don't get cooked in the squad. These are things you're going to need to do if you're going to do something extraordinary, if you're going to do something different and have a different level of success this year than what you had last year. You know, I, lo I, loved, I loved the program because it, it also – it, it runs parallel with all of the articles that you write. Now, I know that writing is one of your real strengths and real loves and the same amount of energy and passion and giftedness that you pour into coaching, you also pour into your writing. Would you mind sharing with folks a little bit how that same giftedness of sharing, encouraging, equipping folks, how you easily translate it from the coaching practice into writing? For me, it was very easy. 
And it's simply a way to leverage. Now, when we look at business models, I mean, we can look at being self-employed or having a business. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is Mm -hmm. a graphic designer or a bookkeeper, they could do those things, have multiple clients, and they create linear income, meaning they do it once, they get paid once. Most coaches go into coaching with the same kind of model. They coach face-to-face or over the phone at least, and they get paid for that process, nothing beyond that. If I take the same principles that have been effective in working with people as coaching clients and write about those, then I have the potential of impacting tens of thousands of people. Now, it's not just because I'm trying to leverage that into a, a big financial windfall, I really love the process, and it's, it comes very easily to me to take those things that I've learned from working with wonderful people like you and many others in the past, and just simply documenting that. The stories about like what Jim Hodges did, like you just referenced there, those are inspirational to lots of people. So all I do with my writing is make that available to way more people than I could possibly see in any given day or week. There's so, only so many hours in a day, only so many days in a week. So that's very restricted. I hit a ceiling real quickly. But as soon as I put that into some kind of a written form, and that can be a blog, a newsletter, a book, an ebook, a manifesto, we can go on and on. As soon as I do that, it has the potential to impact thousands of people rather than one at a time. That's what I love about writing itself. What a great example of being able to share your gift and just like you said, exponentially get that message out and and into many different platforms. And it's sort of like we have to meet people where they're at. You know, some folks aren't ready to engage in coaching and some folks are just sort of as I was at one stage, just sort of learning and discovering that there are other ways of using our strengths and, you know, don't be hopeless, be hopeful. There's so much more that we can control and that we can do. I love the fact that you write and now you're doing a one-to-many approach where you're really getting that message out there. Dan, what would you say for someone who, you know, think of a typical person, you know, sort of they hit their midlife crisis, right? They're, you know, maybe hitting 40 or 50, Maybe they've been laid off. Maybe they want to lay themselves off. <laughs> you know, they're, they're really just thinking, you know, gosh, if I have to live my life feeling the way I feel right now, fairly miserable, I, I don't know that life's worth living. I don't know that this is really what God intended me to be like, you know, um, on his earth. What would you say, with, if you had to boil down just a couple of points for folks to consider to move from point A to point B or C or D, whatever that may be, what are the most important things that they have to make sure as part of their plan? The first thing to do, and this may almost sound counterintuitive because when people are looking for opportunities, the first thing they do is look outward. Mm -hmm. Who's hiring? Where are the best opportunities? What are the hottest franchises or whatever? That can be a very short-term or Band-Aid solution. The only way to really have the confidence of proper direction in your life and certainly career, is to first look inward. So I tell people 85% of the process is looking inward. What are those unique talents that you have? And and that's a wonderful thing about having a little life experience. This is more easily done at 35 or 45 than it is at 20. A little life experience helps us see what is it that I do really well. We ought to understand, as you so clearly help us, you know, what, what is our personality tendency? How does that fit in? What are those recurring values, dreams, and passions of mine? So we need to look inward first. And this is not something that you go sit on a mountaintop for three years. I mean, this you can do in a long afternoon if you want to, or a weekend, or a day away or something. So it's, but that's an important part to do that first. That's a healthy process no matter where you are in that path of life. doesn't matter where you are. That's a healthy process to do. There's nothing that we figure out one time and then just forget about it. This is an ongoing, unfolding process to really read, make subtle redirections in what we do. So somebody who may have had a long work experience already is at a wonderful place to take that fresh look and say, okay, now what am I going to do in the next season of my life? Worked with a gentleman a couple years ago who came to me, 64 years old, said, Dan, I've always just done what other people expected of me. He said, I've never really figured out what I wanted to do. He said, can you help me 
figure out what my purpose, my passion is, so I can go into the next 20 years of my life doing something that's really meaningful to me. Now, it was interesting in working with this guy. He's really a delightful guy. And in looking at his history, it wasn't like he just kind of shifted along at the bottom doing what other people expected him. He had already been, among other things, president of a major university. So he had a lot of accomplishments, but he still felt like he's not sure that it was really his authentic life that he was living. So we figured some things out, and he's just a delightful guy, and I get notes from him monthly now about the things that he's doing. You just can't believe that he's able to do, and not only having the time of his life, but also making more money than he's ever made. But any point in life is a good time to do that. Look inward, figure out what's unique about me, then create a focus. What would that look like in terms of daily activities? How can I put that together with a real plan? Dan, I, I, love, I love the simplicity of the approach because a lot of times we tend to overcomplicate what, what the process of change really needs to be. It's so simple, and you're absolutely right. It, it does start with us because the more we know ourselves, the more we can get in touch with what is that gift, that strength, that talent, how are we wired, and how can we use that in some way, shape, or form in the world. Dan, just now, here's, here's go, go ahead, happened, please. Deb. Yeah, yeah. But, in. You know, it's funny in that our, our brains are wired to resist change. Mm. Now, mm. it just is the way they work. I mean, we create actual neural pathways in our brain because of habits that we have. So we know what it takes to create a new habit, to change that. It, it seems like it's dangerous. It seems like it's risky almost to do that. So we have to somehow get outside of our brain almost and act our way into the new things that we want to do. Now, I also, you know, I get concerned about people saying, well, you know, it doesn't feel good, blah, blah, blah. I think we can act our way and have our feelings catch up later. We make right decisions, and then our feelings will catch up. But that's that's kind of a dicey, philosophical, psychological process. But if we can map it out on paper and say, this is where I want to be, these are the steps that it's going to require to get there. I mean, you're a perfect example of that. What you've done in the last three years here to create a transition plan for yourself. You knew the end result. You knew the steps it was going to take to get there. And if we're willing to do that, we can go in a really positive direction if we have taken the time to clarify that it is a right direction for us. You know, it's funny that you say that because I just went back to a PowerPoint that I had done on a corporate project back in 2005. And this PowerPoint was a project that I had actually was, I was offering to volunteer in the organization. It was totally outside of my responsibilities in the operating side to come in and coach folks on what it is that they do best and how we can retrofit their strengths to the organization. This is long before oh. I even you know, engaged in coaching and my wired style and stuff. I only came across the PowerPoint this week. And when I looked, Dan, at the elements that I suggested were important, do you know that 90% of those are what I already do today now in my business? That's awesome. That's that discovery process. Sometimes it's our own acres of diamonds. Our best opportunity is right under our nose, but we don't recognize it because of the urgency of things we're committed to and the daily routine we go through. That's a great example. Well, Dan, I have to say, if folks um, are really encouraged and want to explore other ways that they can use their strengths and gifts and talents, you have an amazing online community that is rich with a lot of talented folks, a lot of folks that are on the path to uh, learning and growing and discovering, and a lot of folks who've already maybe a little bit further down the path. And um, I would encourage folks to really go to 48days.net and just join in the community, become part of the voice there. There's a richness in, uh, in the whole tapestry of people that are there. Would you mind sharing a little bit how that started? Because I think it has a little bit of an unconventional beginning to it, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I always am looking for ways to leverage you know, intellectual capital and to help more people, all those things that we've kind of already touched on. When this whole phenomenon started unfolding, social networking, I was not a fan of it at all. I had no desire to tell somebody you know, what I had for breakfast or to hear what they had. 
And I kind of framed this whole thing, social networking under that. I had some young, savvy people come alongside and say, Dan, this can be different. We can actually create a community of people who really are thinkers and doers, people who want to take ideas and turn them into real ventures. And they said, I have finally agreed to try it for 90 days. We created the site, 48days.net. And by the time 90 days rolled around, I could see what was happening and I was blown away. You know, I, I truly believe that none of us attain success by ourselves. All of us benefit from the efforts of a lot of people. A lot of mine has come through reading. So even if people weren't alive or I never met them, I benefited from their wisdom. This social networking site has a way to ramp that up. It's a way to, to link arms with other people who are on the same path. It's a brain trust that that is just profoundly valuable to tap into where people readily give advice and opinion to help others who are on the same path or similar path. So it's been it's been extremely affirming for me just to kind of watch it. And in as much as I've done a lot of teaching and directing, doing seminars and workshops over the years, this is different. I can just kind of stand back and see what's happening. There are people whose skills in there far surpass, surpass mine in particular areas. They help other people. When questions are asked, you know, I tell them, hey, you need to go see Justin or Andy or Kevin or Deb. You know, they know more about that than I do. So it's really, it, it has surprised me the, the synergy in the truest kind of way where the efforts of people together equal more than the sum of the parts. I love that concept, and I see that just being borne out with what's happening there. It's a wonderful way to be independent for those people who want to be an entrepreneur and do something on their own and yet not be on their own. They can work with a whole lot of other people helping them attain the success that they're on a path to, to, to receive. Yeah, and I would just encourage folks to go onto that site and poke around. And Dan, your, your uh, regular business site is 48days.com. And um, I just want to thank you so much for everything you share between your podcasts and your blogging, your articles, your writing. You are so generous in sharing your knowledge. And boy, do you have a whole lot of it. So thank you, Dan. Uh, hey, I appreciate it. There's nobody that enjoys the process more than I. But thank you for, I, I'm delighted to be part of what you're doing and your community that you're creating to help encourage people, just as I've had the privilege of doing for many years, and commend you for the path that you're on and delighted to be a part of it. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye.